It's really a great privilege and joy to welcome our guest, Philip Armstrong. Philip is a native of Ohio and has been living in Tulsa, Oklahoma for uh, more than 20 years. I am so delighted for the opportunity to interview him because the, the work that he's doing right now, which after a career in various um, both profit and nonprofit enterprises, has brought him to be <clears throat> the project director for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. I was introduced to him by people that are friends of mine and friends of Fuller's that live in Tulsa. And I've had the opportunity to get acquainted with him over the last few weeks and have so appreciated both who he is and what he's been called to do. So Phil, welcome to Conversing. Thank you, it's great to be here. Let's begin actually where you began, which as I understand it, it was in a small town in Ohio that rather notably and relevantly to this conversation was a town called Wilberforce, Ohio. And in reading about the origins of that name in the town of Ohio, it explained that it was in fact a name for Wilberforce, the great English anti-slavery uh, force. It was also um, really a, a very important point on the Underground Railroad. And so it was a place that had been deeply shaped by a commitment to racial uh, justice and mercy. So tell us about growing up in Wilberforce, o Ohio, and and your own background and how you understand that to have shaped you maybe from really early days. So um, Wilberforce, Ohio um, is where I actually matriculated through uh, university, uh, Central State University, and then also Wilberforce University there in Ohio. Uh, they're both a part of the HBCU system, uh, the historically black colleges and universities. So there's two HBCUs in Ohio, very rural part of um, Ohio, um, much like if for those that may be aware, much like Langston University here in Oklahoma, these land grant institutions that were uh, propped up in, in, in those days when there was a push for educating African-Americans um, and providing, uh, when it was segregated, opportunities for universities uh, for African-Americans. And in Ohio, Central State University, uh, which was Central State College um, and converted in the 1950s, uh, the famous African-American soprano, Leontine Price, is a graduate of Central State College and uh, Wilberforce University, and they're right across the street from each other. Wow. So um, before moving here, uh, I was a sophomore uh, attending Central State and Wilberforce, and I took a class that talked about, for the entire semester, the 1921 Tulsa Race Riot, as it was called back then, this was a spring of 1991, actually, and talked about these historic black towns, all black towns of Oklahoma that prospered in the 1880s, um, Langston being one of them, um, Bowley, Oklahoma, to name just a couple of them. And so here I am in Ohio, no direct connection whatsoever uh, to Oklahoma, and I'm getting all of this history from our professor. Uh, unbeknownst to me that in 1997, I would move here. And then as, as, you, you, know, as you already indicated, you know, f to find myself in this particular position. Um, but I, I would want to note, I, my mother would, would be upset if I did not clarify and say, you know, that's where I had the opportunity to go to um, uh, the university. Um, and, but two hours east from there, a small farm town called Bidwell, Ohio. It's where I'm born and raised. My parents are still there. And the ironic even there with that, um, Bidwell was one of those small southeastern communities, several of them in the southeastern tip of Ohio when West Virginia was Virginia, a slave state. And you could actually walk across the Ohio River and when your feet touched the southeastern portions of Ohio, you were free. So there were a lot of these small pockets of towns where African-Americans settled. Bidwell, Ohio is one of those. And uh, I, I said to this day, my mother and father, in fact, in that area, in that town, Gallia County, Appalachian part of Ohio, they actually have the longest running 
celebration of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. They've been doing it since 1863. Wow. I grew up as a kid every fall, third week in September, every fall, they have a three-day festival there. Uh, and it's the longest running festival that we know of in the world since 1863, prior to Juneteenth, which, you know, ties into June 19th, 1865, they actually still celebrate the actual signing of the proclamation in 1863. So all of that history, and here I am in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, project director of this, this, um, uh, this project and, and this history, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely one where I know God's hand was all in my, I guess, upbringing and training for such a time as this. Well, I obviously want to do, I, I want to come on to the conversation about Tulsa, but this is such a rich vein. I mean, it really does seem remarkable that you were formed in a community that was so self-consciously oriented toward the history of slavery on the one hand, and then the liberation of slaves, really because of both the, the, the examples and places that you've just mentioned and the significance of that history, the way that it was honored, the way that it uh, literally led you into, in, through college to a deeper understanding through the courses that you took, like the ones that you just gave examples of, and then that you would land in Tulsa for this moment. So, so in a certain way, well, obviously you, you didn't start in Tulsa. Uh, it feels like there was a kind of trajectory in that early narrative that carried a lot of the, the, the themes of what you're doing right now. Is that a fair understanding of what you've been up to and how that story unfolded? I think that's an excellent, excellent understanding. When I, when I moved here, um, fall of 97, I was actually quite shocked, to be honest, uh, that here I am, uh, someone, an Ohio native that moves to Tulsa, and I knew more about the history of Tulsa 1921 and than many of the white citizens and, and ironically black citizens who grew up in this area, went to public school in this, in, in this area. And I knew more about this information, this history, than many of the people who grew up here. And so that, of course, you know, in the time that I've lived here and in the nonprofit boards that I've been on, uh, you know, that has pushed me and carried me. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to, to, when I hear people that come up to me now and still, you know, there are, there are those that are in their 20s, 30s, some in their 40s that will call me, will email me and say, you know, I didn't know about this until I was in a college class outside of Oklahoma. Um, and the history teacher starts teaching us about this terrible tragedy that took place in the place where I was born and, and raised. And it's the first time that I've heard about it. And uh, I've had that conversation uh, many, many times. And it's interesting how they, they all say the same two things. Number one, when they first hear about it, they first see it, they're shocked. They're embarrassed because everyone in the class is looking at them and saying, hey, aren't you from Oklahoma? Aren't you from Tulsa? And they have to respond with, this is the first time I've ever heard this. And then the third thing uh, they all say is they get angry um, that why did I have to come to a university setting outside of the place where I'm from to first hear about this? So, you know, they say they call home, they, they call their mom and dad. Do you know about this? Have you heard about this? You know, and they come back, you know, of course, inspired and invigorated to find out more. So for those who may not know the story, let's fast forward considerably and and retell the story of, of Tulsa in, before 1921, and then at the time of the massacre, what occurred? So one of the questions and one of the eyebrow-raising moments is when we begin to talk about the history of African-Americans and Oklahoma well before pre, well before statehood uh, and the land run of 1889, but the, how did Black people even come to Oklahoma. Um, and when you talk about the 1830s and the Indian Removal Act um, and the five civilized tribes that relocated from the deep south, relocating to Oklahoma and Arkansas and taking that trip in the fall of around 1834 and making that very uh, terrible, tough 
journey during the harsh winter months. Um, and of course, we know many lost their lives. But the key point that I'm getting to is that these five civilized tribes, the, the Creek Nation, the Cherokee, Cherokee, the Seminole, Choctaw Bay, brought their African slaves with them. Um, many people, of course, when I make these presentations in schools and different places, you know, they look and, you know, Native Americans own slaves, you know. So, so a lot of this is just an educational awareness. Um, the, the second largest holder of slaves in the South were the five civilized tribes. And so that's when you get into the, the freedmen, for those that don't know the Freedmen Bureau, African-Americans who can uh, directly uh, trace their bloodline lineage to uh, Native Americans. Uh, it's called the Dolls Roll um, because they intermingled and intermarried with them. And so you have Creek Africans, you have Cherokee Africans. And so the 1880s, mid 1850s on up prior to uh, emancipation, you have thousands upon thousands of African Americans and Native Americans occupying this territory again, 40, 50 years before the land run. And so when, as you know, the, the last several weeks, you know, the, the awareness of the importance of Juneteenth, as I, I mentioned earlier, June uh, 19, 1865, when slaves in Texas were made aware that you're free, hence two years after <laughs> the document was signed. Hey, you guys, you're free. You've been free for a couple of years now. Uh, um, so, but it wasn't until June the 14th, 1866, an entire year later, that the Creek Nation released their slaves in Oklahoma. So they were actually enslaved a whole nother year after. And mm. so then you have this allotment of land, um, they were given their fair share allotments when they were released from slavery, from the tribes, anywhere from 40 acres to as much as 200 acres per person. Um, and so that's where the wealth generation really began that leads to the story of Greenwood. If you owned land, of course, you had wealth, you had power. And so through the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, all of these all black towns in Oklahoma, uh, over 50 at one time, populated all over mid to south to northeastern Oklahoma in these Native American tribe territories. And so you had this high population of Native Americans, a high population of African Americans, again, long before 1889. In fact, in 1883, it was once almost discussed that Oklahoma may become or should become an all black state. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, the, the history of African Americans doing well and prospering in these all black towns uh, prospered here in Oklahoma. And so these, each, each, each of these black towns had a black newspaper. And so after slavery, African Americans who had land and were doing well and prospering well, um, there was such a thing called black boosterism. Literally, these papers, these newspapers, black owned newspapers in these black towns were sending pamphlets literally all over the country, especially in the deep south. And in summary, I'll just summarize, pretty much saying, you know, escape the harsh realities of post-slavery in those southern communities come to Oklahoma, you know, African-Americans, black people, we can live free. We own land. We have our own businesses. We're doing well. We can achieve, quote unquote, what would be perceived as the American dream at that time. And it literally was a boosterism of sorts. African-Americans African come to Oklahoma. And so that drove many here as well. Um, and so all of that leads up to, of course, Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, or I should say Glenpool, just a short drive south of Tulsa, uh, the discovery of, of the, the oil and the, and the oil boom. So African-Americans owned land, and then the oil boom happens, and the oil companies, as they're writing those royalty checks to get to that land, get that oil, I mean, literally, African-Americans became, some of them became millionaires overnight, literally. Um, depending on how much land they owned and the discovery of oil. And so 
It wasn't that Greenwood was the only place that had a prosperous African-American community or Oklahoma. Because of Jim Crow and segregation laws, African-American communities all over the country had to become self-reliant communities. They could not chop their wares anywhere else but within their own community. And so by, I guess, a consequence of, of uh, or a side effect, if you will, if I can use that term for uh, Jim Crow, is that these communities relied upon each other. They lend mm -hmm. to each mm -hmm. other. They took care of each other. They So they prospered well because all of their dollars stayed in that community. And so Greenwood, having the land ownership and the oil and gas discovery, Greenwood was one of those communities that it had the most um, concentration of what would we refer to as black wealth than any other place in the United States, literally at this point in history. Um, 10 to 12,000 African-Americans lived in Greenwood um, I think in, in around the 1920s, there was about a, the population of Tulsa and Tulsa County was about 100,000. So 10% of the population uh, for Tulsa um, in the all black town uh, or all black area called Greenwood, you're talking about 33 to 35 blocks. And, and when you just, just think about that, you know, 33 to 35 blocks of all black owned homes all black owned businesses, uh, and it just prospered and boomed and developed as Tulsa was dubbed the, the magic city because of the oil and gas discovery. These African-Americans actually, you know, as the, as the saying goes, you know, uh, uh, the tide lifts all, all boats, all vessels. Um, African-Americans prospered with this and it unique location that it was right next to downtown Tulsa and the railroad tracks, the Frisco Railway that abuts the north edge of downtown Tulsa. So when you got off the railroad tracks, you know, to the, to the south was the city of Tulsa and into the north, all you could see was this black town, uh, this black portion of Tulsa uh, and it doing extremely well. Um, so the history of Greenwood and its development and the all black towns of Oklahoma it is a rich, rich, rich history. It's, it's, it's amazing that, that when, when people start to discover how plentiful and how wealthy these individuals were, it just, it really is mind boggling. And that's all the precursor then to what becomes first thought of as a riot, as you said, but has now been more rightly named a massacre. So tell us uh, a distillation of that story of the massacre itself. So the one thing that we, we do try to uh, educate is that many people look at, of course, rightly, rightfully so, you know, look at the 1921 event itself, May 31st, 1921. But there is a, 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 a narrative yes. that leads up to that in yes. that this was a very racially tensioned moment in time in America. Um, and if you go back to 1906, um, or I should say 1907, um, when Oklahoma becomes a state, the first act of the first Oklahoma legislation, and when you think about that, you know, you, you become a state and you sit around and you think, what's the first law that we're going to enact? What's the most important thing that we can say goes on the books first as our first first law, first ordinance for the state of Oklahoma? And uh, in December, I believe, of 1907, Jim Crow was the first <laughs> uh, laws that the first uh, legislation of, uh, of uh, Oklahoma that was passed. So that gives you kind of the mindset. Immediately, there was this, let's first thing, separate ourselves and let this black community know where your position is in this society and where, right. where the majority stands. Lead up to 1911 in Okima, Oklahoma. Uh, there is a well-known uh, recorded and there's, there's pictures and, and books of Laura Nelson and her son who were lynched uh, 
from the bridge in Oklahoma, in Okima, Oklahoma. That's 1911. Um, when you move forward to that, I believe 1916, the city of Tulsa creates an ordinance that makes it against the law for anyone to live in a community unless there are other members in that community who are the same race. So that's where the, the legal ordinance dividing blacks from whites, you are, it's illegal for you if you're white to live in the black side of town. It's a, definitely illegal for a black person to live outside in a community that has no one else that looks like them. That's 1916 ordinance. So all these things are building up. Then you come to 1919, uh, which is called the Red Summer of 1919. Um, red representing the blood that was spilled and, and this is, you know, for, for your listeners or for your viewers, you know, it's, it's fascinating history. You can go and search this up and, you know, look in uh, Google or, or Wikipedia, but you can type in the Red Summer of 1919, and it will detail uh, over a dozen all Black communities across the United States that in one summer had experienced racial violence, literally um, uh, white citizens, white mobs, uh, of course, affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan that just would go in and destroy these communities. Um, and again, it all happened in a short period from January to around July, August, the summer of 1919. And from D.C., Houston and New York, and one of the most prolific ones is uh, Elaine, Arkansas, over a thousand black citizens killed and murdered simply because of this animosity towards these communities that were doing well in spite of segregation. Many soldiers who returned from World War I, many white citizens, you know, were having a hard time economically, trying to find jobs, trying to find employment. So if you have this mindset of superiority that one group is are, are beneath you uh, economically, uh, mentally, spiritually, and you see them doing well, driving a better car than you, living with greater standards of living than you, uh, having apparently more money than you, it caused this animosity to rise up. Um, in Oklahoma, from 1919 to 1929, was the largest increase in membership for the Ku Klux Klan in Oklahoma. Because, and when you think about it, all of these historic black towns in Oklahoma um, if you were, again, a white citizen that felt a certain way, you were thinking, my grandfather, um, uh, he was born in a small town called Hazelhurst, Mississippi. And he was um, a product, uh, I'd say, of, of, of mixed um, descent, uh, African-American father, um, from what I've researched and know, uh, Choctaw, Mississippi Choctaw um, mother, and so he and his siblings were fair skinned and um, what some may say had curly hair and uh, had attractive features. But he would talk about many times the only reason he could get an education in Hazelhurst, Mississippi at his age is that he was light enough to show a blue vein. That was the standard then that literally if your skin was light enough and you can show a blue vein, then education is worth giving to you. So the opposite of that is if you're too dark, there's no need in wasting education on you. Just go ahead and send you out to the field or hard labor. But that was the, the, the mindset. So, if, so when you have a state where all over there's these communities of black people doing well, it created this air of uh, this uh, aura, I should say, of animosity, of anger. They think they're getting better than we are. My grandfather would say, you're getting uppity. That's an old uppity, southern term. Exactly. You're getting uh, uppity. It's just and the so, word I was thinking of, yep. Yes, that's exactly, that, that mindset. And so all Tulsa needed was, kind of, Tulsa was a tinderbox waiting to basically explode. And that's what 1921 ended up being. Um, and, I'll, and I'll go ahead and, and lay this out here as far as, as, as lynching's concerned, the atmosphere around lynching. In the summer of 1920 in Tulsa, a young white man was brought out into the, the uh, Tulsa Square and lynched. His name was Roy Belton. Roy Belton, young white man who actually, um, with his uh, female companion, actually robbed 
a taxi, a taxi cab driver. And in the course of that altercation or that incident, he ended up killing and murdering that taxi cab driver, another white man. And a lynch mob formed, a white lynch mob that formed, they pulled him out of the jail and they lynched him in the town. In Greenwood, the newspaper was uh, run by a gentleman by the name of A.J. Smitherman, and he was the editor of what was the Tulsa Star, the all-black newspaper. And he wrote an article and wrote several articles basically telling black citizens of, of Greenwood, basically, we need to band together. We need to be very careful. We need to be vigilant. We need to protect each other. Basically, if they will do this to a white man, Imagine what they will do to us. That was the thought. So it was a call to arms, really. So that was 1920. And so here we are, 1921. And the way what happens is a young black man, a 19-year-old teenage boy by the name of Dick Rowland, and a 17-year-old white girl by the name of Sarah Page. She's an elevator operator. Dick Rowland is a shoeshine boy, and he's working downtown Tulsa, one of the few jobs you could probably get as an African-American back then. And there was only one place downtown that Black citizens who worked downtown could uh, use the restroom or public facilities, and that was in the Drexler building. The third floor of the Drexler building was the only place that had colored restrooms. And so he went to the Drexler building on the afternoon of May 30th. He gets on the elevator. Um, something happens with the elevator, a shifting, and maybe it didn't rest on the floor correctly, but he loses his step. Before falling, he reaches out and grabs her arm. She lets out a scream. The elevator door opens up and he runs out. Across the street, the white merchant comes over to ask what happened, what, you know, are you okay? Um, by that afternoon, um, the Tulsa Tribune, they're no longer in, in uh, a newspaper that was here at that time. The Tulsa Tribune reported in the afternoon paper, the evening paper, front page headline, NAB Negro for attacking white girl in elevator. And many historians and many of us believe that that really, that, that article in the Tulsa Tribune is really what sparked uh, and led to um, the massacre. Um, so again, if you, and the, the way the article was written, it's very salacious. Many newspapers, for those who are journalists will know this term, uh, many newspapers back in those times in the 1900s practicing what was called yellow journalism. And it was basically newspapers competed to who could tell the most salacious story. And uh, it was more entertaining. Uh, and I, I actually use this in, in my school groups and, and I say this uh, as humor. Um, in, in, in our modern day era, we're not the first ones to come up with the term fake news. Uh, fake news has been around for a long time. It was just called yellow journalism. And so the article went on to talk about how this black boy uh, scratched, tore away the clothes, um, physically harmed. It basically set the stage that this young man tried to rape a white girl in broad daylight in downtown Tulsa. It described Sarah Page as this sweet, innocent young lady who's going to business school at night to pay her way to make a better life. None of that was true. Not one bit of it was true. But it did what it was intended to do it was a rallying call, a rallying cry. Um, Dick Rowland is arrested the following day, May 31st. Um, a lynch mob begins to form later that afternoon uh, uh, that numbered, according to the newspapers and reportings, about a thousand uh, white men surrounded the courthouse. The word gets to Greenwood that Dick Rowland has been arrested. Uh, they're gonna try to lynch him, probably just like they did Roy Belton. And about three dozen African-Americans who had served in World War I, they had their own ammunitions, their discipline, their, uh, their, we're going to go down and protect Dick Rowland. We're not going to allow this lynching to take place. So they had their own weapons. They marched down for the sole intent to stand around the courthouse and help the sheriff and help the, 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 uh, the, the sheriff at that time to basically stand guard to keep a lynching from happening. 
That led up to about 10 o'clock, between 10 to 15. The, again, you have a, about 1,000 uh, men that are a part of the white lynch mob. You have three dozen black uh, war, war, war one uh, soldiers that are surrounding the, the facility. And uh, one of the, the white members tries to go up and disarm one of the black soldiers. In that wrestle and that tussle for the gun, the gun discharges. And that happened about 10.30 p.m. And at that moment, quote, in the Tulsa Tribune, it said, all hell broke loose. And uh, there was a fight, scuffle, gunshots. The black soldiers retreat back to Greenwood. Um, by 11 o'clock, 11.15, the Tulsa Police Department deputizes many of the members of the lynch mob. Uh, they actually break into gun stores. They get ammunition. They get more guns. They go and call for more to help. That mob increases to about 1,500. And about 11.30 to around 1, they begin to march into Greenwood, literally invade Greenwood. And that's when the looting, the destruction, uh, the literal murdering, shooting Black citizens on site began. And this went on for about 18 hours straight um, until all of Greenwood literally was destroyed. Mm. It's really uh, an, such an extraordinary story, not because, in a way, such things are un, are not familiar, because they are familiar, you do hear these stories, but it's the scale, it's the massiveness, it's the contrast, because of the, the presence, really, of success and wealth that had been growing in the African-American community, the tinderbox that was probably always there at some level, but then heightened by this particular form of journalism you're describing and all that. Um, and then, and then as I understand it, uh, this is partly back to the people that you said grew up in Tulsa and didn't know the story. It's as though the whole thing just ends up getting buried, like literally buried. First of all, it's just worth pausing and acknowledging that in the last two weeks only, uh, some of the mass graves that were apparently made at the time of this to deal with the, how many people altogether are thought to have lost their lives? The official report is uh, 300, yeah. um, and that is based upon, and, and that's the difficulty, it's based upon um, those who provided eyewitness accounts, statements, those who were able to say, um, my husband, my son, or my daughter, or my children, I can't account for them, they never mm -hmm. returned, um, but the estimates are realistic between, between 300 and 1,000. But the official number is about 300 uh, right. that, that, that lost their lives during that time, African-Americans um, that, that lost their lives in Greenwood. And the, the difficulty for us sitting here in 2020 is when, when people think about, you know, mass graves, you know, what, you know, why are they having to do this? Why don't they just go and look at the records? Why don't they, you know, within the next two or three days after the massacre, you know, Bodies basically were literally uh, from eyewitness reports, and, and, and this is uh, recorded now. The Oklahoma Historical Society and the Tulsa Historical Society were literally, they were bodies were piled on wagons and they were taken out uh, in different remote areas of town. Mass graves were dug and, and bodies were thrown and, and, and covered over. There was not a coroner that came through to determine the time of death. Uh, there was no call for the uh, funeral home to come and claim the body. They were literally just taken and buried. And so, you know, you have you have family members to this day, descendants that, you know, they've never been able to memorialize their loved one. They don't have any death records. Um, all they know is that one day, their father, their grandfather was here. The next day they were gone. And, you know, 99 years now has passed. And we're now at the point where um, really people may have the opportunity to have closure. Um, the current mayor of Tulsa, uh, Mayor G.T. Bynum, I'll use his words, is that um, when someone is murdered in Tulsa County, it is our responsibility to find out what happened. 
So literally, this is still uh, legally an open investigation. Uh, and so these burial sites are, are, are uh, crime scenes. So as they discover and as they find, and hopefully they will find them soon, uh, the remains um, to be able to determine you know, the difficulty of who they are and, you know, DNA extraction, but um, ultimately, you know, to give people the opportunity to say that, okay, it's taken 100 years to do it, but at least finally my family can find out if our loved one was one of the people that was murdered during that time because we have no trace and no record of anything ever happening with them and knowing what happened to them after uh, 1921. So I just want to say for those who are listening to this and may not have been following this story, which has been more prominently in the press in the last couple of months than it has been probably for a long time, um, that there there are several projects going on. There's the the discovery of the mass graves uh, and that was potentially discovered about a year or a little more than a year ago through some special technology that is now available to potentially find those sites. Then they've just begun, it was about two weeks ago, I think, uh, the excavation of those sites to see whether or not they are, in fact, mass graves that are there. Then you have, and that just has its own just unbelievable emotional and historical and and uh, other implications. Then you have this um, this move from seeing this as a, as a riot that had presumably been caused by Blacks um, but was actually a massacre that was brought on by a white response to this alleged incident. And then you have uh, all of the silencing that goes on for so long. And tell us just a little bit about how that really unfolded. It's easy to understand just because of the way the white dominant culture can silence what it doesn't want to pay attention to or doesn't want other people to pay attention to. So some of that happens, but undoubtedly, you know, there's a kind of, I assume there's a kind of rising and falling of awareness of this and probably always quite strongly, clearly within the black community, but within the white community, which controls the media, there's almost no attention given to that or the school books that children were raised on in Tulsa without any knowledge of, of what it was that was really giving an account of this event. Is that, is that was, is that the right narrative or is it something how, somewhat different than that? Actually, yeah, that, that is the right narrative. And, and, the, the, the power structure at the time, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, during this time period, you know, Tulsa was still on the rise as this, and it was nicknamed and dubbed the Magic City. Um, this was not just an incident that happened to the Black community. There, there is what the modern day term would be racial trauma. If uh, mm -hmm. this, this right. incident was traumatized, of course, the city, you know, black citizens were continually traumatized going forward because there was always this thought that this could happen again. Right. Um, uh, and as I said, the, the increase in the numbers of the Ku Klux Klan from 1919, uh, the increase went all the way through to 1929. So there was always this prevailing thought in the back of black citizens' mind, you know, we got to be careful because they could do this to us again. Um, so they didn't want, there was uh, maybe even uh, PTSD. I don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm not going to share this with my children. So that's one aspect uh, from, from the blacks. From the white community, it was, oh my goodness, what a black stain, what a black eye on our community. We're better than this. We don't want to be known for this. Uh, 1,500 citizens out of, uh, you know, 80, 90,000, you know, have, have marred our city. We need to make sure that we just, let's, let's do better than this. Let's cover it up. Let's continue on. And so they didn't teach about this for years. The Tulsa Tribune actually destroyed their pictures, their evidence, their articles. Um, all we have is, you know, uh, the, the, the copies that other people have been able to save over the years, but they destroyed everything. The Tulsa Police Department, they destroyed um, many things that could have pointed to this happening. And so you have the um, amazing ability for a city to go 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And unless your grandfather or your grandmother or someone in your family would tell you the story uh, in a 
familial way, do you know that this happened? Or, or for some black families, don't you ever forget this, that this happened? But as far as it being taught in an organized curriculum or a structure that this actually occurred in our city, that's, you know, that's how you get past that or that's how you can get to that point. And it goes so long that eventually people forget about it. Um, the generation who knew that and lived that dies off. And so there's no one to keep the story going. And actually, ironically, it was the Oklahoma um, Murrah building bombing that kind of brought the conversation back to the surface. Hmm. Because, you know, the, the conversations that were taking place in 1995 was, you know, you know, what a terrible tragedy, what a, this terrible event, this bombing that has taken place. And conversations began ha happening. Well, hey, guys, uh, this is not the first time that an Oklahoman has bombed and killed other Oklahomans. You know, you know, there was this incident called 1921 where, you know, we have actual eyewitness accounts that are held by the Oklahoma Historical Society where planes during the massacre were flying over Greenwood. That's where how much of the devastation took place. When you see pictures, it looks like a bomb dropped and leveled everything. It's that these planes are flying over and dropping incendiary devices and bombs on homes, on buildings. So they were catching fire, kerosene bombs, catching the roofs on fire, the rooftops, and then they were burning from the top down and did total destruction. And so when you see these pictures, it, it is just, you know, as far as your eye can see, it's just, there's nothing there destroyed. And you could only have achieved that if there was some type of air campaign over top, because it, it's very familiar uh, when you look at pictures from, you know, wars and things of that nature. So again, if it wasn't for the incident in Oklahoma City, that kind of brought to light and historians began teaching and talking and saying, hey, you know, don't forget about 1921. That led to actually the first commission. This is, I'm the project director for this commission. It's the second. The first commission was actually um, 1997 to 2001, where they did a full investigative report on what happened in 1921, the destruction. They even made recommendations for uh, reparations that should be paid back to the victims from the state to that's where they, and it's a very inclusive, all inclusive report that you can look up online. It talks about how the, the, the local uh, guard armory unit, how they were complicit um, and the Tulsa Police Department and how the fire department stood back and did not go in and put out the fires. It just it just goes on and on. It really talks about it in great detail. Um, but but I want to say for those because I, 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 two questions I get asked all the time is you know why did you change the name? Um, for some it's, it's it's an emotion as you touched on it's an emotional thing. Like why are you trying to change history? You know, um, and so with our logo that says the Tulsa Race Massacre uh, Centennial Commission. And it used to say the Tulsa race riot. And the community said, the first thing we need to do is address this, that it was named a riot. It never should have been named a riot. And so in our logo, you actually have the word riot is crossed through and you have massacre to show the intentionality. Yes, we changed the name on purpose and here's why. The Tulsa Tribune, the mayor at that time, the city council, dubbed this a riot. And when you did that, none of the victims, the business owners, the homeowners, could get their remuneration or could not file insurance claims because it's a riot to this day. And that's what, again, a lot of people are just uh, uh, aghast by is that not one person has been able to file a claim, an insurance claim, and that claim get paid um, and there's a, you know, here in Tulsa, there is actually a memorial and it has a listing of all the businesses and homes were destroyed. And it has a listing of the value, the, the, the actual value of the business and the home that was destroyed. And it equals about 1921 is about 2.7 million. Um, today, those dollars with, you know, the value of money over time and inflation, it's estimated about 25 to 30 million, which are conservative efforts. But could you imagine 25 to 30 million dollars of destruction being done in this day and age and not one person be able to file an insurance claim? And so, you know, this could have been described in many different ways. It could have been called a pogrom. It could have been called a, a, a disaster. It could have been uh, called 
uh, a number of descriptors. The last thing that it should have been described is as a riot. A riot is when community individuals if within their own community rise up and do destruction to their own community. That is not what happened here. Mm. And so we tell people this was not a riot. This was a destruction of a community by another community that came in and massacred individuals. So that's where that name change comes in. It's a breathtaking story, honestly. It's it's overwhelming. And um, I remember the very first time I heard about it, I happened to have a, a pastor friend who lived in uh, Tulsa. And I had literally laid down what I was reading and instantly called him and said, what do you know about this? And he had been there. He was not from there. He was a, a Yankee. And he had <laughs> uh, moved in and only been there for maybe five years. And at that time, he said... You know, I, I've heard it referred to, but I'm embarrassed to say, I really don't know very much about it. Now, that person has left Tulsa, but, uh, but before he left, um, we had a good conversation about what had happened. And um, part of what struck me was his growing awareness of, of the tragedy and the unfolding implications and how it had affected uh, the white community that he largely served in his own pastoral ministry, but also the longer he had been in Tulsa, the more he felt like it was this under underlying narrative that was there all this time, underseen, underknown, underspoken of, and certainly under responded to. So what I find amazing about your job right now, <laughs> Phil, honestly, I first I just want to say how deeply grateful I am for this conversation. Because of its tragedy and pain, it's so important that it be honored and it's so important that it be rightly recognized and engaged in by the community. And there are, if anyone is interested, you can go onto the website of which we'll provide the link for in the contact information beneath this uh, recording to be able to find more information about this. But when you go there, you see this picture of, of the, the many, many different things that are all happening in this centenary year. But I think the main thing that I want to underscore is that it is still, as you said, an unfolding reality. It's not just a historical uh, recognition as though these things are done, gone and, and over, and now we can grieve them historically. It's more like, no, this is actually still playing out with living implications. And in a real community with obviously many generations, in some cases having passed, um, but you're juggling so many different dimensions of a community's response to one of its most painful, and I'm sure for many, complicated uh, histories. So so t just give us a little more of a story for you as we come toward the end of this interview, just for you. What is it like to stand in that vortex and help a community tell the truth, help them tell it to each other, help them try to engage in a history that many of them, of course, were not in any way directly involved in, may not even have lived in Tulsa, but many were, or their descendants may have been. Um, and it is still a living point of pain and and uh, a lack of justice and a lack of reconciliation. So, I mean, how do you do that? Literally, how are you walking in that space? Well, obviously, and I'm not just saying that because it's, it's you and I talking here, but obviously it's the grace of God, number one. And I think, the, we've kind of already touched on the fact that, you know, for such a time as this, I have no doubt um, for, for that. But, you know, you, you really, really crystallize what's taking place in our community. Um, this commission, um, the second commission was founded in 2015. Um, so it's taken that amount of time to build trust, to have these difficult conversations for people to realize this is a this is this is uncomfortable. <laughs> Number one, it's very uncomfortable to talk about. Um, but in order for us to truly move forward uh, as a community, as a city, state, uh, nation, um, there are so many lessons out of this. Um, there is a bonding. There's something about tragedy, facing it, facing the truth of it, the reality of it, where people can talk about it. There's, there's a healing, literally, that takes place. And, and even with people who say, look, 
I, I was I wasn't around back then. You know, that was 100 years old. Why do we keep going back? You know, you just keep stirring up people's emotions. All you're doing is making people upset and mad. And it's really um, one of our prevailing quotes that we utilize among the commission. And it's actually going to be on the museum that we're building, the, the Greenwood Rising, the, the Black Wall Street um, History Center. On the exterior of the building is a quote, will be a quote by James Baldwin that says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So we've been spending the last five some odd years helping the community face this together. Um, and I've been on phone conversations. I've been on Zoom call conversations with a, a white, it might be a white gentleman who quite candidly, you know, is just telling me his thoughts and his feelings. And, and, and a lot of it is, you know, I heard this and I've heard that. And by the end of that conversation, he's in tears. He's, he's saying, I don't know why I'm crying, but I feel like I'm, I'm I don't know why, I don't know. And it's amazing the healing process that comes about when people just, wow, you know, this happened. Uh, this is a horrible thing that happened and that we're here a hundred years later and still finding ways to bond the community, black, white, what have you, young, old, around this. Um, Senator, Ke State Senator Kevin Matthews, African-American who started this commission, he's our, our chair and our founder. Um, he was the only African-American at that time serving uh, in 2015, state senator, and he reaches across the aisle, um, and the person that responded the, the, the most and has become a friend of the commission is Oklahoma Senator, uh, uh, U.S. Senator James Langford. So, and I, I say this, and I say this with intentionality. You have a black Democrat, you have a white Republican in one of the reddest political states in the union say, you know, let's put our ideological differences aside and let's join forces because people need to hear this and we can utilize this to be almost like a center for people to come and have racial healing and have be able to, to, to unify over something that happened so many years ago. That's really what this is about and what it's leading to. So we tell the full story. We don't just leave it there. We don't just make white people feel embarrassed or mad. It's let's face this together. Um, we, we will, we want to tell the story, how the days after the massacre, um, the American Red Cross, they are dubbed as um, uh, angels. Um, that the, 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 the work that they did to bring uh, what they were, they were called refugees, but to bring the citizens of, of Greenwood back to feed them, to nurse them. We, we will have in the museum actually minutes and notes from the Holy Cathedral Catholic Church downtown, First Presbyterian Church, First United Methodist Church, white churches that harbored black citizens, hid them in their church basins and fed them. Um, and obviously domestic workers that worked in white homes, how they went and found their domestic workers, their families brought them to their homes. I tell, you know, I try to tell, you know, the teenagers and different students, listen, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Not every white person in Tulsa was trying to kill black people in 1921. Right, there right. were white citizens who were appalled and shocked and did what they could to try to bring some sense of normalcy to a, a horrible situation. And so we use all of those stories. We, we have to use those stories. And, and I know we're coming to an end, but, but I have to, to, to share this. This is a true story. Um, I am associated a lot with the Tulsa Mass Graves. And it's, it's, it's a city of Tulsa project, but we support it as a commission. But because of the, the narratives, you know, I get calls all the time. And, and last fall, when this announcement was made and the Tulsa Mass Graves investigation was gonna go forward, um, ironically enough, I am a bowler and I love to bowl. And uh, I, I bowl with, with with gentlemen in the fall, and it is the uh, and I want to say this in a very lovely way because it's sincere. If you want to see uh, gentlemen who are going to have that uh, red blooded American, uh, I, I I am uh, patriotic and and have strong feelings about you know where we are in our nation today. You know, go to a bowling alley. You know, um, but I also realize that. I have some of the most wonderful friendships 
with black and white men and women bowlers in these bowling alleys. The point that I'm getting to, um, there was a, a gentleman by the, um, uh, the name I said his last name, Mr. Bodine. He's 70 some years old, Tulsa native, white gentleman, grew up in Tulsa. And he came up to me one evening and he let me have it. He said, Philip, said, why are you all doing this? And I said, whoa, whoa, what's wrong? And he said, you're digging up these bodies. We, we, we weren't digging up bodies at the time, but you're digging up bodies. All you're doing is making people upset. You know, why would you all do something so insensitive? That's just terrible. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. He's just going on and on. And so I let him get it out. And so uh, I waited and I said, Mr. Bodine, can I ask you a question? And he said, yes. And I said, what if your grandmother told you that one day your grandfather, some big incident happened in Tulsa and he left the house to go help his neighbors and he never came back. And that's all you know. And your grandmother can't tell you where he's buried. She can't show you a, a, a death certificate. You've never had a memorial, never had a funeral. All you know is that one day grandpa was here and grandma said he, he left to go help some people and we have no record of what happened to him officially. And I said, and 99 years later, somebody comes to you and said, hey, I think I know what happened to your grandfather. In fact, I think I might know where he's buried. I said, would you and your family members not wanna know that? And you could see the tears well up in his eyes. And he just looked at me and said, I, I've never thought about it like that. Every Monday after that, we bowl on Mondays, he would find me, come up to me and say, Philip, what's the latest on the, on the mass graves? Have they found anything yet? Every week, a complete 180 turn hmm. just by having a conversation and say, can I give you a different perspective that maybe you haven't taken into account before? Mm -hmm. Completely changed him and made him an ally for something that he was initially against. Mm -hmm. Those are the types of stories that are being repeated over and over with the work that we're doing here. Well, Philip, it's just really, it's just very, very deeply moving. I, I do want to say that I think some of the most treasured friendships uh, I have are, are at least some of the, those people are in Tulsa. And they are wow. people who are identifying with the need for this work to be done. And they are uh, huge advocates of you and of the whole uh, enterprise. But it does just also say a lot about what is being taken on. And I guess I want to say it, it leads me to think that this is an example of a kind of localized version of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission like happened in South Africa, where over time, you're trying to not only name the truth, but bring forth the people, get the narrative re-clarified, retold so that people are freshly reminded of really what it was, not for the sake of, of trying to cause people to feel morose, uh, but for the sake of being able to, to own together as a community, a truth which, without which, as Baldwin said, you can't really go on and, and see further change occur. So uh, to me, God has known what he's doing in bringing you and other people along to be these uh, reconcilers, these truth tellers, these um, narrators to try to help people understand the nature of what has happened and to be able to tell it as truthfully and uh, truthfully and honestly as possible. And then to be able to do the, the community work that's needed, which is in a way the purpose of it. I've been around the start of a number of different museums. And one of the things that has been so fascinating to me is how they become organic living communities of an ongoing enterprise. So it's not, I used to think people just went to a, a museum and they went, left. That's true probably for the majority of people, but that there are people that become completely changed because of the way that, that the museum, and in this case, that all the surrounding activities are going to help that story to be rewritten. So. Phil, you will be and have already uh, been in my prayers. They will continue. If uh, if it's possible to be there next spring, early summer, when all of this is remembered, I certainly hope to be there because I I just want to witness God's grace and, uh, and say thank you to you and everyone for the work that you're going to be doing between now and then and that will follow from this. So God bless you and God, God bless, bless Tulsa, you. a treasured community of 
of people who have lived an extraordinary story and uh, are living an extraordinary story even now. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for your thank prayers you. and thank you for your friendship.